1. It's raining very hard. There is a great sea storm around Uba, Hyulva, and it's hindering the ships from departing. The storm is causing heavy winds and rains in whole country Betica Hispera, Adelusia. It's evening when two chariots arrive at the city gate of the provincial capital Corduba. The driver hands over a scroll. The guards read it. Open the gate. A message for the governor. Open the gate. The gates open. The chariots pass by the public baths. Strangely enough, there are many young folks there in this weather. The streets are for the most part empty. The chariot stops at the governmental house. Fifteen scrolls are brought inside. The governor enters into his office. Governor, there's a message from Olisipo, Lisbon, for you. It requires your immediate attention. He takes the scroll and sees the imperial seal on it. Governor of the Happy Betica. We, the administration of the Lusitia district of Olisipo, make an appeal upon the imperial law to hand over a group of men who are suspects in our area. They were involved in piracy and robbery of the taxes from the province Lusitia. The stolen tax are about 200.000 denarii. The money has disappeared from the treasury over a period of eight years. These men were, at the time of the theft, accountable to the Provincial Department of Finances at our capital Emerita Augusta, MA with tilde copyright symbol rider, to secure and register the collected taxes. Because these men and their families are residing in the lands of Beteria, they fall under your jurisdiction. Therefore, we request you to arrest these men and hand them over to the criminal court of Pax Julia, Baja, to stand trial. Those men are Thomas Pachilles, Verus Pequas, Prosquius Themius, Valerio Tamarikis, Essaeus Felicius, Danus Damatus. They all served in the Spanish Department of the Imperial Navy, two have also served in Armenia. We have informed the authorities in Hispalis about the matter. The civil court at Hispalis has agreed to keep the suspects incarcerated until the end of February, because this city is the closest to the Beteria area. Furthermore, there are local festivals this winter in Pax Julia. Osuba, Olisipo, Emerita Augusta and Caesarea Portus. Our bureaucracy is too occupied at the moment to also deal with this case. The costs of the incarceration will be funded by the prosecutor at Pax Julia. The men may have purchased farms and other properties. We require the confiscation of these properties to pay the debt they owe the provincial Lusitia. Rome is being informed about the matter as we speak. The sentence of these men will, on approval of Rome, be death. If during their time in Betica Hispera, they also committed crimes, we are ordered to ship them to Rome to be tried. We also urge you to investigate everything about these men and their doings in your area. Greetings. Elis the governor of Eleusitia. The governor, after writing an order, commands one of the legionaries to come. Bring this to the centurion and I want this to be executed immediately. The legionary arrives at the military camp with the message. The same moment the centurion gathers twenty-five men on the horse and they depart for his palace. It's still night and still rainy. At the same time it's also the moment the Sabbath has begun for the Hebrews. In the synagogue at his palace the Hebrews break bread and eat it. They also have Spanish wine from the area to drink with it. They always celebrate and keep the Sabbath. 
no non-Hebrews were allowed. Adaiah, who is the ruler of the synagogue, gets a very awkward feeling as if something quite ugly is about to happen. 2. It's evening, and quite cold, when a ship arrives in the bay. There are three Roman soldiers who are guarding the ship, the captain is guiding the course and all the other passengers are asleep. The sky is filled with stars and you can see the northern lights. From far they notice the harbour. The candles are burning and the street is illuminated by public lamps. When the ship arrives one of the soldiers hands over a document to the harbour chief. After reading it, he approves the parking of the ship. When she ship was anchored in the harbour the passengers got up. Three soldiers, the captain, five merchants and Ludovicus, who is the king of the Mexisto tribe. The Mexisto tribe consists out of 34.000 people who are a breed of Lusitias, ancient Portuguese, and Eregos ancient Norwegians, people. They have twelve villages, two small harbour, one city and two large basements filled with wine, oil and maps. Eludovicus grabs a horse and rides to his second house, just an hour away from the commercial harbour. The house serves as his private palace. It has nine large bedrooms, an office, a public bath, two big barns, a dining room with kitchen and a large wall around it. When he arrives at the gate, the guards recognize him immediately. Majesty! Let me through and come on inside. No need to watch tonight. I'm back. They bring his horse to the barn. When he's inside he hears that people are sleeping. The servants, hired soldiers, his two wives, five concubines and his eleven children. He goes into his office. Everything is as he left it four months ago when he left for his journey to Caledoia, Scotland. He sits behind his desk and sees five letters from the city. He begins to read through them while he is reading Anna walks in, his wife from Save Area. Latvia. She is attractive, long, slim body, small but tight breasts, long legs, soft light skin, blonde forward slash orange hair, two eye colors, brown and blue forward slash green. Anna. You re back. I heard you coming in. Awake again. You know me. I often sleep late. She sits on a chair beside him. Legs crossed I've been writing to my family. How long? Since two weeks before you left. You want to visit your parents. They came here she shows them a letter one month back, they came and stayed her for two weeks. But. Because they became possessive and greedy. I've sent them away. Where are they now? There's at a luxury hotel in some Aragoa city five hours away from here. It took them eleven days to travel from Save Area all the way to Aragos, ancient Norway. So. I didn't want to be disrespectful by sending them back. I have no problem if they remain here in this palace. As long as they aren't bothering you or the kids. Let them remain there. When they were here, my mom began to command me and to rule my life again. She never changes. I decided to just give in. You know. When she doesn't get her way, hell breaks loose. I don't want her to treat you like that. Well, I'm used to it. I am not. Did you use perfume? I bought some exotic flowers in the city three days back and begin using it in my private bath tube smells good, doesn't it? Yeah you know, go back to your room, 
I'll meet you there within 30 minutes. I need to go the public bath myself now. After the bath, Ludovicus visits his Saveria companion. They aren't legally married because in Erigo marriages are nothing but social agreements made between the parents of the weds. Because of that you have many temporary husbands and temporary wives. Many women marry to get housing and to have a man providing for their children. Ludovicus has taken five women as house slaves. He made them his concubines in exchange for housing and money for their families. Furthermore, they all conceived two children for him. They are excellent mothers and frequently the children visit their maternal relatives or their maternal relatives visit them. He met Anna on a trip he made in the twelfth year of his reign. He visited the country of the Saverias together with twenty other noble princes from Erigo. During the hunting festival, he met a small farmer, who was divorced and living with a prostitute. His daughter was lodging with him to work during the festival. He became friends with her. She was quite introverted, reserved and didn't trust people. She appreciated his friendship. They kept mailing each other. The mail service between Erigo and Saveria takes eight days with ship and chariots. After two years of correspondence, Ludovicus departed to Saveria and paid her parents 2,500 denarii. A denarius is a Roman gold coin, worth ten assis, silver coins. A denarius is a one-day way for a soldier and a three days way for an employee, and 1200 zero assis, Roman silver coins, as bride price for their daughter. This was the custom when a foreigner married your daughter. They travelled back to Erigo, to the city of the Mexisto tribe. Anna met the children of Ludovicus, his concubines and his relatives. She also get acquainted with the Mexisto tribe and made a few female friends. Five months after her arrival in Erigo, they had a private party and celebrated their wedding. Two years after her becoming a princess of the Mexisto people she visited her hometown and she was reunited with one of her childhood friends. Her childhood friend came over to live with her at the royal court. Ludovicus also took an Erigo a girl as wife to get on good terms with the local population. She gave him a daughter, Lee. Anna lies next to him, while he hugs her from behind. She turns around and tongue kisses him soon she takes off her top and underwear she hugs him again and leans on the pillow she open her tights. And she feels his tongue playing with her sensitive spot. Then her vulva is licked she moans. Then he softly enters her while holding her tights, he entertains her with his strength and hits her G-spot repeatedly. After a while she releases her wetness of her excitement. This makes her entrance more easily to pass through he gets more rough. And then he spits his white fluid inside her uterus. Till she's filled with it. She feels her womb being filled with the warm white mass. When he lays next to her her pussy is dripping with the semen she is happy. It has been a while since she enjoyed his semen. Four whole months. While she's dripping the cum, he's playing with her breasts and licking her face. Ludo she turns around I want to visit Saveria again. I want to take some of the girl servants with me. Aren't you happy over here? Yes I am you're quite kind to me she smiles I just like to see my old place again. They'll probably still treat me the same way as before we got involved. Ah well. You're an Erigo a princess now. So you'll return with Spleda. It's fine.
I want to go as if I'm just one of them. Good. But I'll send two of my sons with you, Lucrecio and Lusiteros. They are good with the spear and swords. They'll protect you. Fine. For now. Let's sleep. Hugs. 3. The next morning Princess Anna takes a bath, dressed herself and took a chariot to Jehuduam, the capital and only city of the Mexisto tribe. It's called Jehuduam after the tribe Israelite tribe of Judah, which is called Jehuda or Jehuda in different Eastern languages. Duam is Latin for a large field of grass. The city is built in a fertile plot of grass field with many bushes, surrounded by hills. The Lusitias that came to Erigo 220 years back were a group of 39 male Hebrew slaves that fled Roman imprisonment, together with 132 Lusitia young women that fled with them. When they arrived in Erigos, the women slept with the Hebrews and bore them many children. Within 40 years, there were 34 10 Lusitero Hebrews as a result of it. They spoke Lusitia and Hebrew, together with Greek, the official language of the Roman Empire, whom they fled from. 1400 of the Lusitero Hebrew men chose Aragua women as spouses and have their children with them. Now, five generations later, there's a mixed tribe of Eleusitias, Hebrews, from the tribe of Judah, and Eregoas. They are all related together. They call themselves Mexisto, 34,000 of them live around Juhuduam, and 12,000 of them live further in the north of Eregos, in colder landscape. The family chiefs in Eregos are a bit hostile towards the Mexisto tribe due to their wealth and their mixture with their women. Fifty years earlier the king of Aragos officially forbade the Mexisto men and women from marrying people from Aragos, however, thirty years the law was rejected by the new king of Aragos, who wanted to have peaceful relations with the mixed tribe. The Mexisto received a big land mass as their heritage in the western mountainous area. They also build a city in the cold north. The Mexistos are basically economical independent of Eregos, but they only pay a yearly tribute of their income to appease the nobles. The native Eregos are around 600.000 people and the population remains the same without any growth. Princess Anna arrives at the central palace where the city council of elders are discussing daily matters. Good morning, Majesty, one of the female servants at the court greets her how is Ludo. He's back from his journey. We had a good time yesterday night good. Come keep me company. The servant's name is Evelai. Evelai has curled brownish hair, bright eyes, tall body white hips, a flat booty and nice formed breasts. She's wearing a grey transparent top, a long decorated white shirt that ends between her knees and hips. Her panties are white and lightly visible through her shirt. She also wears two silver necklaces and two golden rings. At her belly she has a belt that keeps her shirt together. Her saddles are white with flower decorations. She's the granddaughter of Kilie, a Aragoa noblewoman that left her husband and family in an adulterous love-rape affair with a Mexisto boy who was just 14 at the time. The province of her origin was quite embarrassed by the issue, so they excommunicated her and disinherited her from their community. The woman was already in her thirties but she gave birth to four other children within three years. After five years the boy, at the time 19, had enough of the forced sexual contacts and threatened to kill her if she made another move on him. Tule, the community leader of Mexisto at the time, 
intervened and prevented a bloodshed. Tule understood that the murder of this expelled Aragoa woman can be used as an excuse by the Aragoas to start a military campaign against them. Something they had no chance of winning. One of them was Aliza, who at age 20 married the grandson of her father's elder brother who served as a warrior in the Roman legions in Cappadocia. That grandson's name was Padus after the large river in northern Italy. Padus' marriage with Aliza was quite unhappy and they only had one daughter. They both live separate. Evelie sometimes visits her father, who lives in Cimbria. For now she is a house servant of King Ludovicus, but the king entrusted her to his Saveria wife. I am ready. Come on in. The room is small, has two small sinks, with two silver taps. The carpet is blue and comes from Egypt. There's a large sofa, in the shape of a table, which comes from China, two large windows, a wardrobe with documents and a chair. Evelie is lying on the sofa with only her panties on, she smeared herself in perfumed olive oil. On her breasts there are grapes, around her neck small blackberries, on her belly there are pieces of grain cookies, cakes, on her hips there are some spiced herb leaves, on her legs there are drips of honey, with strawberries. She put all her hair in a kerchief. Besides her all a lot of fruits and raw vegetables. Anna steps in and takes her heels off. She kneels at the sofa. With her legs spread and her butt rests on a big pillow she takes some of the cakes and eat it. Where did you learn this? When I visited Dad in Cimbria a few months back there were Chinese women there, I believe they were slaves bought by a Cimbria merchant. They often would get naked and other servants would place dinner on their skins. At the Asians together with the Cimbria rich men would eat from them eat. Anna feeds her some of the grapes and the honey. They also feast on the vegetables around. After dining, Anna shows her a letter she had written for the Mexisto city in the far north. Good. Please, give this letter to one of the mailmen at the palace. I want it posted immediately. But wash yourself quickly at the fountain outside and wear a towel, you might distract the men. Hold on. She sits right up on the sofa, take off her panties and throws it in the corner. I too be right back. Evelie does as she was commanded. When she returns, she sees that Anna has changed the blanket that was upon the sofa, for a clean one. Anna was lying on the sofa, with legs crossed and she was drawing on a wooden tablet. Evelie throws the towel in a basket. She then opens the legs of Anna so she will have room. Nice panties, she compliments her master I didn't knew you like red. Evelie raises Anna's dress till her belly. Evelie then sits between her legs with her own back towards her master and leans on her. Anna receives her maid servant on herself. She then embraces her with her tablet and continues drawing in front of her. Beautiful flower. Thanks. Did you draw anything lately too? Ah. I've been writing. Writing what? To a guy at the mining industry, around 30 miles away. Ah. You have a boyfriend. He's been here around three times but I don't know he is quite timid. A lot of the men of Eragos are like that. And you're tall, remember that. It can intimidate them. True dad warned me not to marry an Arago a dude. Some of the people might know about my grandmother. She is an old and stupid woman now. And she is whoring around with the men at the mines. 
any association with her might get me labelled as a harlot too. Well, he's right Anna puts her tablet down. She turns Evelie around, face to face and kisses her on her forehead. Relations between us and the rest of Erigos are a bit fragile. It's because some of the men here also served in the Roman army that they have some respect for us. Back in my homeland, at Save Area, mixed families are lynched. They aren't liked at all. Everly rests on her chest, on her right size. Anna plays with her hair. Why don't you ask your father to wed you to some Cimbria guy or some warrior from any other German tribe? You're fertile and beautiful. They will pay an enormous bride price for you. Anna continues but once you've been given away you have no rights anymore. And you'll have to put up with all the mistreatment of your man. That's why I'm not quickly to get married and I'm suspicious of that Erigo dude also. He is kind and sweet. But still. I'm cautious. You should be. I became good friends with Ludo before I got involved with him. He had five house servants who had kids for him. It's common for leaders to do that. However, to establish the community the elders wanted him to have at least one stable housewife to gain public respect. This was to prevent the women from going to men from Eragos. By him having a housewife it would empower the women to become more assertive in demanding marriage from their lovers. Ludo agreed upon this with the elders two months before his sick father passed away. His father Tule was a tribal chief and had 52 children with 19 different women, most of them were German prostitutes. Only 30 of those children were with Mexisto girls. No woman wanted to remain with him due to his bad temper and the tendency to throw objects at people when he was angry. Because Ludo, as the new chief, would be often a way to establish stable economic contracts with the German tribes. The elders didn't even bother with the agreement anymore when Tule died of an grievous infection at the age of 69. Ludo, who inherited a great amount of wealth enforced a reform and took the title of king and commanded a basic training in foreign languages for all the tribe. He still wanted to give the right example to have a queen consort. In his twelfth year as ruling prince he visited Save Area to attend a hunting festival. He met me and two years later he paid the bride price and I was transferred to this beautiful country. The elders knew about the marriage. But it was only five months later that we consummated our relationship. Five months. That's a lot. I was becoming more social here and I felt more comfortable with my role as queen. Ludo had his concubines to deal with. Some of them didn't like me it was a bit though. But they all accepted Ludo's decision eventually. The concubines were probably scared that they would lose their homes and that their children might suffer because of his new consort. I heard of a German prince that after his second marriage, his first wife died prematurely, he chased away all children from his first marriage and disinherited them all. All because his new wife wanted to have all the attention of her new husband especially after she found out she was pregnant. Those kids became beggars and some ended up in prostitution. I'm glad they accepted you. Well, I was kind with them and made clear I meant them no harm. Aren't there any good men? In your homeland? Save area? Yeah. Maybe you can send letters and recommend me to someone over there. Not such a good idea I think. Why not? 
Well only the men recommend potential wives and always it's the father of the girl that takes this responsibility. For me to do that for you would bring a very bad impression. Ah I understand. Evelai picks up her tablet. Why won't you draw me? You want it. Yeah make a painting the house servant stands up. She's still naked. But completely clean. She sits in the chair, legs crossed and hands before her breasts Anna paints quickly and the result is beautiful. Make another one. She keeps on the ground, lower her upper torso and face to the ground and lifts her hips high. Anna makes two paintings of here. One from behind and one from the left side. They are beautiful. Everly is glad can I keep them. Fine but be patient with that urge or guy. He might mean well and if it works well, you'll have a great husband and possible many babies soon. Yeah she smile while she puts on another white panties. These paintings might help. Maybe don't worry the two friends leave towards the elders who are now arguing about their northern city. Some of the Scandian vagabonds are lodging in their northern city. Those Scandian vagabonds are debtors and unwanted children who gathered in small gangs. The council of elders are divided upon whether they should give shelter to those people. Ludo is back. He is in the second palace, near the river. He is now spending time answering letters. Call for him today or tomorrow and discuss it with him Anna suggests the council meanwhile, Queen Thea, can travel to the north with a crew. And she can have a banquet together with those vagabonds. Thea is good in building social bridges between people and calming tensions. We both have been managing stuff here often in the absence of Ludo. Didn't we? The president of the council answers look, we rather discuss this with Ludo himself. This concerns non-domestic policy. We however are open to the idea of a banquet. Queen Thea is the second housewife and queen consort of Ludo, she's from a poor peasant family in the east of Eregos at the border with the Scandian tribes. She was only 17 when she was crowned. The celebration was held in her birth village, and many Scandian peasants were invited also. Their marriage was consummated in a sailship while coming back. The celebration took five full days before the couple left. The wedding was also used by her family to reconcile conflicts between the Eregos and the Scandian farmers in the area. Ludo also made an agreement with 16 Scandian farmers, 10 blacksmiths, for employment. In exchange he let some masons from Lower Germany, a Roman province, present-day Netherlands, to come over to construct several small roads for the peasants and they received 20 sail ships as a gift. She conceived and gave birth to Princess Lee nine months later. Anna has been queen for five years now, and Thea for three years. Both women get along well. Anna however prefers to hang out with her maid servant, also because she is lonely, with almost no friends and her relationship with her parents and siblings is horrible. 4. Someone knocks on the door. Come inside. Everly enters. Everly. What a pleasant surprise. Thea offers her some water drink some. Everly drinks and explains Anna wants to talk with you. Where's she? She's at the harbour. She's waiting for you. Good. Let's go. Both women leave and walk towards the harbour. At arrival they enter into the storage. Come she's downstairs. They enter the basement. 
and Anna is waiting there. At the wine bottles. Everly leaves. What's going on Anna? There has been some issues at the council today. We receive some messages that a lot of vagabonds from Scandia has been lodging in and near our people in the north. Have they spoken with the king about it? He is now talking with the council. A decision will be made within a week. But for now we decided that it isn't wise to wait too long before acting. The trip to the north takes three full days. What are you suggesting? That we both go to Bethiludum, together with Parasius, Ludo's firstborn, and have a feast. A feast. It's a good way to distract the city from the vagabonds. It will also increase their feelings of safety. And we will get to know who those vagabonds are. Sounds good. I will leave Evelai behind here to take care of my stuff. We will remain away for about two weeks or three. It's winter, remember. We will leave tonight. Get ready. I will she gets excited, but then remembers of her daughter. But hold on, what about Lee? I can't just leave her behind like this. The concubines will take care of her, together with the other children. Number. I won't do that she shakes her head I won't leave my girl behind with those creeps. You see. Jealousy and envy are very dangerous. People become predators because of envy they might harm her. Are you serious? Come on. Yes. I'm very serious. Look, I'll come. But I'll take Lee with me. Fine just hurry up. In the early evening some chefs, some of the servants, two elders, both queens and a lot of wine, oil, and other packed ingredients are shipped out of the harbour. Everly watches them leave before she walks back to the storehouse. Ludo agreed to allow Everly to have access to the harbour houses and to the private rooms of Anna. Parasius is 24 years old. Ludo had him when he was only 16 years old. He was in Lutetia Parasirum, Paris, in the Celtic kingdom Lutetia, in the Roman province Gaul. He was lodging there on his journey through Gaul and Britain. While he was at the Roman theatre he met a female slave, who was enjoying the games. She told him about the difficulty of her life, of how she is humiliated repeatedly by her female slave owner, who is the wife of a local banker. Ludo, together with his travel mates, decided to go further to Massalia, Marseilles. They found out later that the slave girl followed them on the road. The two travel mates of Ludo were afraid that they might get in trouble because of the girl. Ludo compelled his mates to head towards Helvetia, Switzerland. From there they could follow the Rhine towards the Rilad and from there return to Aragos, through the east coast of Cimbria. He planned to take the girl with him. And they did. One month later when they arrived at the house of Tule, Ludo requested his father to accept the girl into the household. Tule allowed it, on the condition that she would be Ludo's slave and that he alone had to bear the economic responsibility of taking care of her. Ludo accepted the terms. When he noticed that one of his older brothers showed some interest in her he impregnated her. One year later, when their child was three months old, Ludo built, with the help of some of his friends, a large house near the harbour. He went there to live with his slave girl. Paulia, that's her name, however didn't live as a slave. She was free and even had her own money from time to time. Five months after her first childbirth she conceived again. 
Three years after the birth of Parisius, Paulia requested to visit her homeland Lutetia in Gaul. Ludo travelled with her to Parisium. They found out that, two months earlier, her former slave owner had killed her husband and was sentenced to death. The brother of the murdered banker took over his brother's property and slaves. When she came at her former home, some of her associates recognized her. Ludo paid 1,000 assis, silver coins, to liberate five male slaves and six female slaves. Four of them wished to remain with Paulia. They hoped to find a husband in the country where she was at. When they arrived back in Eregos, there was a huge vendetta going on between the peasants around the Mexisto tribe and also among the Mexisto families there were tensions. Ludo proposed the four Belgian women to some of the older men in his community. They all refused. After two months, Ludo decided to take them as concubines, to prevent them from being sent away by the elders. Within two weeks of sexual intercourse, all four conceived. Tule lent his son money to expand his house near the harbour, and it became a mansion with Roman-styled gardens and baths. Nine months later three sons and one daughter was born. And within a year they were impregnated again. When Ludo was twenty-one his father died and he succeeded him, not as chief but as a king. Parisius become the heir apparent to the throne, each of the Belgian women become princesses. The coronation of Ludo was not appreciated by the villages and nobles in the west of Eregos. They took it as an insult, not because of the title, but because the Mexistos were a mixed tribe and not many in number yet they were quite wealthy. It's their envy that led them to take offence. They were also scared because of Ludo's connection to Gaul, therefore with the Romans. For five years there were spies from the Aragoas coming to target him. There was also the incident when Parisius was kidnapped at age 11. When the eldest brother of Ludo found this out, he and a gang of 45 men raided nearby villages. In these fights they killed around 79 people. To avoid further escalation Parisius was returned well and unharmed. Ludo paid for the reparations of the villages and included the widows into his community. In the eighth year of Ludo's rule, when Parisius was 13, he sent Parisius to Rome. The other sons receives a military course in Lower Germany, paid for by Ludo. In Rome he became a military officer and he learned architecture, politics and trading. Parisius also visited Gaul frequently during his time in Rome. When Parisius was 20 he was discharged from the army and he returned back to Aragos. He was glad to see his siblings again and he met the new wife of his father, Anna. Parisius at return married two girls from his own tribe and had five children with them within two years. His younger brothers also each have children. One of them has six. The sisters are unwed and are under the care of Ludo's court. Ludo has attained full Roman citizenship and Latin rights due to his collaboration with the Roman administration in Gaul. His sons only have limited Latin rights, due the fact that they were born outside of the empire in a country that wasn't subjected to Roman rule. The kingdom Aragos itself is quite involved with Roman, German, British, Greek, African and Chinese merchants. Because of this, they want to avoid domestic military conflict. This would weaken their homeland and would make their area easy for Roman annexation or easily targeted for military conquest of neighbor tribes. Ludo is benefiting from this circumstance. Furthermore, 
his elevation from chiefdom to kingdom was to prevent to assimilation of his people by the native Aragoas. His associations with Roman Gaul also makes him economically beneficial to the economy of Aragos in general, therefore the adversaries of his people are forced to be at peace with them, at least externally. 5. The Letter of King Ludo to the Synagogues in Frisia Shalom Brethren I greet you with tender love and loving kindness of Yah. Last Sabbath I returned from my journey to the country of the Caledonians. I travelled through the British Islands, including Hyberia in a course of three months. There are many Israelites, from the tribes Judah, Gad and Dan living among the heathens in Britain. Most of them live around the Thames River, where the Atribates and Triovates tribes dwell. Both kingdoms were quite hospitable towards me and my crew. The Israelites in Britain live in small villages, each of around 500 people. Each village is led by a village chief, who is often the eldest male. Pork is not eaten there and the Sabbath and Torah are kept in honor. There are, according to the princes of the Siluaries kingdom, around 226 Israelite villages in Britain. Together around 113.000 Israelites in an archipelago with 5 million Gentiles. There are also Egyptians, around 5,000, who are a part of the Osiris cult, living among the Druids. As a king of my tribe I desire to have more Israelites in my kingdom. I will finance the construction of at least 10 synagogues in the country Aragos and 30 apartment complexes for our people. Send young men with their wives over and I encourage them to procreate. There are less than 10.000 Israelites among the Aragos. The Israelites are the blessing of the nations. I'm a Judea from a large group of political prisoners who fled Spain five generations ago. Even though I'm mixed with Eusatias, my whole family line is consists out of half Hebrews, half Eusatias, I desire to preserve our Israelite heritage among the nations. You, rabbis and elders, are invited at my court in Jehuduim which is nine days removed from the port city Momomais by ship. You are welcome in the spring season. My two wives will be hosting the meals. I also desire to wed out my six daughters to young Israelites. Sedekiah who Yishiahu Ludiahu, ruler of Jehuduim, king of the Mexios. The letter was delivered exactly eleven days after the departure of Anna and Thea to Bethiludum, to the synagogues in Frisia. There was a delay of three days due to a delay, because of a rainstorm, at the shores of Cimbria. The letter was written twenty times so that each synagogue was certain to have one copy. The rulers in the synagogues came together in Momomais and discussed the matter. This man is the son of the warlord Tuleahu, Eleusatero Hebrew, and therefore he is one of our people. He succeeded his father as prince of his Eleusatero Hebrew tribe and he desires to maintain our customs and our spread heritage around the world. It would be unwise of us to exclude him. He can be a good ally for us against the hostile Roman rule that afflicts our people. But we must be wise also. He definitely is thinking of his own profit. He wants the support of the Israelites around the Germanic Ocean, the North Sea, to have economic and military backup for when he's in conflict with the Northern European tribes. We will attend his feast in the spring and we'll wed out six young men to his daughters. We will also send the poor among us to live in Jehuduim. But that's how far we will go, lest we get into territorial conflict with the Gentiles. The journey from the harbour of Jehuduim to the harbour of Bethiludim, 
by ship, took the crew four days and nine hours. The local governor received both queens and their servants with great delight. Two days later there was a great banquet and 228 vagabonds took part of the feast. They were a group of families that fled their tribes due to scapegoating or a criminal conviction of the father. The feast endured four days. After the fourth day the governor agreed together with the queens that they would keep the vagabonds inside their city walls until the summer season. The men could easily perform defensive and inspective labor for the 12,000 civilians that lived in the city. The nearest settlement was in the country of Scandia, which was two days removed, across the mountains. Near the Somi tribe. The seventh day of their stay two Scandian women, approached Queen Thea and requested to become her maid servants, in exchange for maintenance, shelter and protection. They were married, but their husbands were killed in a massacre and they became widows. To escape the shame of not being desired for marriage again, they fled with some sojourners to the north. When they heard of Bethlehem, they decided to take chances with their lives by seeking asylum here. Both women are sisters, blondes. Thea accepted and granted their requests. They also had to promise not to get involved with any man, especially not her husband. Thea spoke their language, which she was pleased with. 6. Everly is relaxing in the bubble bath when she hears someone walking in. She opens her eyes and turns around. It's Paulia, a consort of King Ludo, and Pie, her daughter whom she has with her German lover. Pie is 19 and her mother is 41. I'll join you and Pie takes off the towel and gets into the small pool lovely. Paulia enters into Three women in a bubble tub. After a while Pie gets up and leave. Everly notices that Paulia is staring at her. She ignores it. Then she feels Paulia hand grabbing her arm. And she ends up in the grip of her, face to face. What are you doing? Paulia. Paulia squeezed Everly's left breast nipple and caress her left breast afterwards what's going on. Everly feels embarrassed and overwhelmed. Tell me you've become quite close to Queen Anna. I often see you two together. At the market, in the city, in the harbour. We became best friends. We have a lot in common she is frozen not resisting she's away now. To Bethel village in the north of Eregos she'll be back within two weeks. Paulia has been gazing and praying upon Anna's maid servant for a long time. She is envious of Anna's close friendship with Eveli. Her own relationship with her mother and later female servant was verbally abusive. Her slavey hour also made a few sexual advances upon her before she fled away. She always resisted and the advances never came to fruition. Her unforgiving attitude caused her to become the same as her former slave master. The offender is already dead for decades, but the offense is still alive in Paulia. She never released the anger. When years passed by her vengeful emotion has turned into a predatory lust towards weak and vulnerable women. Her own daughter is often avoiding her to prevent molestation. She complained about her mother attitude with her elder brother, Parasius. Parasius didn't want to get involved, but advised her to have a minimum of contact as possible with her mother. He knew that Ludo probably didn't want to address Paulia, due to her narcissistic violent rages. Parasius himself disowned his mother years ago after she persisted in blaming her son for her affair with a German soldier. Misreal, 
the brother of Parisius, another son of Ludo and Paulia, made clear to both parents that he doesn't tolerate any toxic people in his life. Misrael himself is married with and he has four children that he begot with his Hebrew wife. He also has a concubine who is pregnant with his fifth child. Misrael refuses to allow Paulia to contact her grandchildren due to her hateful personality. Misrael however is on good terms and close to his father. So you must be lonely now. Paulia grabs her butt and squeezes them with both hands while she also tongue kissing her victim as long as she's gone, I'll take care of you slave. Everly is emotionally weak and defenseless. She gives in, as Paulia expected. Pie was at a distance and witnessed them so close together in the tub. Also how they got out and how Anna's servant remained physically attached to Paulia. She hid herself from their sight and she decided to follow them. Paulia takes her to Anna's room. Open it. Ever like commands. She's wearing the towel and is still a bit wet from the pool. Paulia is dressed. She grabs the key from Everly and closes the door behind them. Suddenly, she pushes her on the floor and sodomizes Queen Anna's friend with her fingers. Everly is both overwhelmed with hurt, because of the violation, as with sexual pleasure. She didn't dare to say stop. Besides, didn't she willingly gave in? Please, don't be rough. Paulia undresses herself and lays her on her back. She ignores what the girl is saying. The action is followed by Pauline giving oral to her anus and her vulva. I've never had intercourse before she admits with neither man or a woman. Everly has an orgasm in her face. Her fluids are licked clean by her violator. Paulia walks into the wardrobe and begins to change her clothes and wear some of Anna's clothes. Everly is confused. This will be our secret, okay? Everly nods. Paulia changes back to her own clothes. Take off the towel. She throws some clothes to her dress. People can't see you like that. You are the spokesperson of the queen. Everly unpacks the clothes. It's a panty, a short skirt, two decorated knee socks, a small top and a long shirt to cover her torso. Paulia then sits behind the desk of Anna. I really like you, Everly she admits you're quite childlike and soft-minded. Everly blushes. She then picked two dark heels of Anna and puts them on. I'm leaving now. I'll see you tonight at dinner. Paulia opens the lock, gives back the key and leaves. And five after she was gone, Pie enters the room unnoticed. Everly. Ah oh, hi Pie. I didn't notice you coming in. What were you doing with my mom? Excuse me. How long have you two been seeing each other? I really don't know what you're talking about. Pie closes the door and sits on a large sofa. Everly sits beside her. Look, Everly. You have to be very careful with her. She is an insane woman. You are very hard on her. Your own mother. I know who she really is. She grabs her chin to get her attention watch out with her. She has been preying on you for a while. I noticed it. Just like she did with many others. Everly is shocked. Others. She is often seducing and raping young women. And she always gets possessive and physically violent towards them. She one time tried to overpower an Aragua singer. But the singer was physically strong enough to resist and chase her away. 
Then that's not all. She also lies. All the time. She also lies about her children and often accused men of raping her. One time she even out make up on and pretended as if she was harassed. She caused a lot of problems and even tore down families just because she didn't have her way. Oh gosh. Why won't you stay at Ludo's place? Anna requested me to look after her stuff in her place. Then we'll do that together. All right. Fine. Everly thinks for a moment you like some apple cider. Not now. I still have to wash some dishes and clothes. Pie leaves. And Everly is lying on the sofa, drinking some apple wine. 7. Alva is the wife of a hunter Alphadress, who is also the chief of a tribe of 1500 Scandians at the Great Lakes District in the southwest of Scandia. There are many swine, bears, deers and other wild animals around here. Her husband has been away with a group of hunters. Seven years ago there was a butcher festival in the country of the Save Areas. She attended the festival, together with more people from her hometown. Some 1800 people from Scandia visited the event. In total there were around 1800 zero people that attended the Save Area Festival. The event happens every four years. She remembers that at the festival, that endured for almost two weeks, there were also rulers and princes of noble families present. Her husband became acquainted with a man named Ludoyahu, who was a tribal king of a small tribe living in the western edge of Eregos. They nicknamed him the Lusitia chief of the Lusitia town in the West Alphadress and his wife enjoyed the company of the Mexisto men. They even made an agreement to exchange goods. Past seven years the tribe has exported a multitude of deer meat, horse meat and beef to Jehuduam. And they imported many sheep, oxen, textile, papyrus and eastern spiritual books from the Mexisto tribe. Alphadress has sent five families, of 65 people, to go and live in Betheludum and ten families, 220 people to live in Jehuduam. Alphadress and the elders in his tribe did this to strengthen their influence in Eregos and Cimbria. Alva is at her mansion when a minister arrives with an urgent message from the government. There's a Roman ship that came from Cimbria and that landed at their harbour. There are a few soldiers on board and five male passengers. The people in the city are upset. Some are even speaking about a possible annexation of their district by the Roman Prisipate. Your Highness, we request you to settle this matter. Alphadress is not returning back for at least five days. Alva put on her crown and fancy clothes and sends servants to make an appointment at the principal court to meet the sojourners. The city is gathering on the central square to witness the whole happening. The city rulers are also present. The Roman soldiers walk before the five men and they stand still before the seat of the tribal queen. They also kneel down to show reverence. Gentlemen, what is the goal of your sojourn to our community? They speak ancient Greek. We are citizens from the country Spain, at the west of the Mediterranean Sea. We are fleeing Roman rule, as many others have done. We desire to have accommodation in your land and to get employment in your kingdom. We wish to contribute to your community in a reciprocal manner. Spain has been under Roman rule for at least 200 years by now. Or more. Are you criminals? Or are you spies? We have no connection to any government agenda, your highness. 
we have our documentation with us. All right. This is how we'll do it. You'll remain in one of our inns this evening and tomorrow we'll decide what to do with you. The men are led away. They hire rooms at the local inn. Alva remembers that there are some of their kin's people living at the Lusitia village three days away from there. She constructs the idea of sending the men to the city of Ludovicus, so that her people won't have to put up with them. The Romans are known to cause division in tribes, to later conquer them. The next morning Alva gathers the elders and tells them that she will go to Jehuduum together with those men, together with her daughter Aslog. She commands the elders to keep the matter quit and to inform King Alphadress at his return. 8. The governor of Bethiludum agreed together with Queen Anna and Queen Thea to send half of the former vagabonds to Jehuduum. They could contribute to the labor in the villages. There were 18 empty ships in the harbor of Bethiludum. The ships were the property of Pathos a Greek merchant that married a Mexisto's woman and begot two children there. He agreed to rent his ships for the transport of 120 people. The costs are 20 a cease per ship. The governor pays the money from the treasury 360 a cease. The ships departed 18 days after their arrival in the north. It was in the morning. At the same time Evelai is bathing in the sea, near the harbour. There's a small fog in the area. She hears voices. She then notices that a ship is passing by. HMM. She gets back at the shore. And hides behind a tree. The ship arrives. There are three soldiers and a woman getting on land. Evelai sneaks closer to hear what's happening. I'm Alva, wife of Alphadress, king of the Scandian Gortii. I desire ordered with the king. I also desire to have a good service for my guests. Who are they? Those are Romans, they arrived in our country past week. In the absence of my husband I've decided to bring them here. My husband and his men might interpret these Spaniards as a provocation of the Romans. I desire no military confrontation. We are on good terms with King Ludovicus. There are also several Gortii families living in your villages. Alva pays the fee for entrance. Good. You're free to enter. After this the five men show up and Alva's daughter. Together the ten walk towards the small inn at the harbour. Evelai overhears them talking about staying in the small rooms for four days before continuing to the city. 9. Evelai rushes towards her room at the harbour. Takes a towel to dry herself followed by dressing quickly. She is only wearing two white knee socks, blue heels, a long white shirt held together by a golden belt, two bronze necklaces and a copper ring. She doesn't know what to think of it. It will be at least two days before Queen Anna and Queen Thea and their crew would return. She is missing Anna. However, she doesn't dare to tell her that Paulia molested her. She is afraid that Anna would blame her and cut off their friendship. So. She hides it. She didn't expect such behavior from her. She barely knew her. While she is dressing up, Pie walks in. Hey Pie. Everly is happy to see her. Hey Everly. Good morning by the way. M. Um, do you know anything of those Romans that are lodging here? Pie is wearing a long blue dress till her feet. Her sandals are brownish. A pink top and she has a purse of leather on her arm. Her hair is in a knot. 
she is wearing golden earrings with green stones in them. Romans I saw the ship passing by an half hour ago when I was bathing in at the cliffs. I followed it. Some woman, I think she is a leader of some kind, paid a lot of cash to the harbour master to be able to lodge over here. Did you go and ask them? No. Why should I? Maybe we should report this to the elders. Pie. Pie. If these people meant harm. Like if they wanted to annex our community, they would have arrives with spears, swords and infantry right now and kill off many people. By the way. Eragos is quite removed from the Rhine River. And the Romans have a lot of difficulty defending the Rhine so for them to annex us. They would have to annex the whole kingdom of Eragos, together with the kingdom of Ciembria. They are not capable of undertaking such an enormous task. Probably these people only want to trade or exchange culture. I don't trust them. Why aren't you asking them? Everly picks a branch of white grapes and eats some of the fruits. And puts it to Pie's mouth to eat. Pie eats the whole branch while Everly is hugging her tightly. Don't he worry about it Pie. She kisses her on the cheek while she's eating. Let's forget about it and play some games. Maybe we should go to the Basilica of Eragos. The royal capital. Yeah. Pie picks a small scroll she bought at the Eragos capital a few weeks back it's the story of Poseidon. Or Neptune as the Romans call him. Beautiful scroll. This is in the Scandinavian language. The capital is about two days from here and to go to the Great Bay from here is about 11 hours by chariot. I've been to the Great Bay district some time back. My father worked there. There were, according to my father, 474 ships there in the 22 harbours. Many Germans, Romans, Greeks, Sarmatians, British, Chinese. Mayans, Africans and Jews trade over there there are also many clubs and parties. We can go to the Great Bay also. There's a straight road between the mountain range and the bay, near the Eriga River. Sholti we wait till the queens are back. You rewrite. We should. Let's wait another five days. Then we are certain they are back. They need to be here back before spring arrives. Why? Everly drinks some water from her cup is there anything special? Well, besides the equinox equinox celebration there are also many Israelites coming to Jehuduim. King Ludo invited them and offered them accommodation. So. We will have possible more villages and a growth of the population. Well, we might get a husband from them. Well, I prefer a regular guy. Pie sits on the sofa I am not Hebrew and their culture is quite strict also no pork is allowed. And I love eating swine. So salty and delicious. Besides, Hebrews are quite exclusive they seldom accept half-breeds. Pie. The whole Uso Eragos community here is a half-breed of Hebrews only a small part is just Eragoa. I am not sure how Ludo will integrate the Hebrews here. Well. That's his problem. Pie sees, as Everly is leaning back on her chair, that she isn't wearing any panties. You're going to seduce someone. Today. What do you mean? I see your pussy. Ah. True. I often swim and bath myself in the water around here. It's quite safe and when I come back to my room here. 
I just walk around in a shirt. And my socks. She grabs an apple and bits into it. It's a bit warm today normally I close all windows. Because of the cold during the winter time. It will get colder soon. Warm days are only exceptions. You still want to go down and inform what those visitors want. Ah. Never mind. Pie takes off her sandals their problem. 10. When it turned evening, the area became colder and it began to snow. We need to heat the floor. Pie remarks hold on. I'll light the fire in the wardrobe below. She grabs some firewood and dumps them in the fireplace. When she returns, she already notices the floor getting warmer. Great technique of the Greeks. Heating the floors. The snow is getting harder. And the windows are covered. Furthermore, it's dark outside. The lamps inside the apartment lighten the space. After Pie is finished lightening the candles, Evelie enters the room. She has three scrolls with her. Pie. Come help me open these scrolls. They sit down on Evelie's large bed. You re quite cold. Yeah. I had to rush all the way to here. Everly gives her a closed bottle Ive got you some wine. Thanks Pie drinks a bit from it and closes the bottle, puts it on the floor next to the window it's delicious. It's a quitire wine imported by Ludo's concubines from Gaul. I know. My mom is one of them remember. She smiles so. Where did you get these scrolls? They are a part of the private collection of the elders. Anna also has a few of them. I have access to them. These are some historical chronicles. They are written in Greek. Pie opens one of the scrolls. It's a map of Northern Europe, with marked native roads, Roman settlements, and sailing routes in the area above Greater Germany. The map was made by 12 retired Aragoa Navy officers who were rewarded with lots of wealth by the former King of Aragos. The two Luso Aragoa cities are also marked on the map. The map is quite detailed and beautiful drawn. It is as if they were captured and elevated above the clouds. And saw the whole landscape. Most maps are quite ugly. Everly tells you see. It's common for people to visit witches of wizards to get charms for protection on long voyages. Sometimes, they even do supernatural stuff, like levitating even to the height of the clouds. To see if an invading army is coming. To make such a map they would have to levitate all the way into space. Maybe just below the stars. Great map. HMM look, there is a large legionary camp of the Romans just below the Cape of Cimbricum. It's in the northern part of Cimbria, which is where the Jutti tribe lives. Jutti comes from Judah, right? Yeah those people are partially descendants of Jews not all of them though. But. Hold on. How old is this map? Let me see. After checking the date. This map is made two years after the Battle of Teutoburg Forest. That's one year ago. I still remember when the news reached Aragos. Hermann, also called Omeius by the Romans, the son of a German nobleman, defeated three Roman legions. 30.000 men. Because of that, Emperor Augustus withdraw Roman rule till the Rhine River. However, I doubt this story. Why ever lie? Look. 
I'm not saying that the murder of the legions didn't happen but... Look. The Romans are back at the Rhine borders. Right. However, there are still many small Roman cities in Greater Germany. There is even a Roman legion stationed in the north of Ciembria. Why? Isn't it strange that the trade between Northern Europe, Sarmatia and the Roman Principate increased after the great defeat of the Roman army? And why would all the Germanic tribes accept Amias as their king? Just like that. Well. You can explain that. How? Pie. Think about it. What would be a better way for Rome than to kill off 30.000 people of the army? Pretend as if they are defeated. To make people in Italy forget about Germany. Remember. Many Italians live in cities. The farmers are often exploited by the Roman state. And those in cities are often poor. Also there are over two million slaves living there. As a slave. Wouldn't you want to travel to some great area of land? To start your own family. To flee slavery. It's very easy to fake documents and to pretend to be a Roman citizen. Far more easy than people think. To Romanize Greater Germany would imply that those two million slaves in Italy would be needed to build up Roman villages in the north. This would mean that the economy of Italy would collapse, because they depend upon slavery. Most German tribes are free and it will be almost impossible to enslave a great amount of them. So the emperor had a problem here. So what do you do? You send a German prince who has become a Roman through education. You let him revolt and kill of many of your own soldiers. To give a message as if the Romans were defeated. Meanwhile you have many German princes who have become client kings who pay tribute to Rome. Those client kings are paid a lot of money and enjoy great civil benefits. Then you build a few hundred small Roman villages around Great Germany in this manner. You don't annex Greater Germany into the Empire but you include them into the economic domination of the Empire. So they are a part of the Roman Principate, without being really into the Roman Principate. This will also discourage people below the Daub and Rhine River to ever cross to Germany. So nobody will find out the hoax. Now that you've said this, it makes quite sense. Do you really think that everyone believes this bullshit of three legions killed? I'm not saying that no soldiers were murdered. But those soldiers were for the most part young poor men who only had a chance of survival by joining the army. So. If their lives are sacrificed. Who cares? And now that most people in Northern Europe and Britain hear of the defeat of Rome. They will relax. Thinking that Rome is not a world power after all while the Romans are expanding more than they realize. You get me. It's not uncommon for armies to make blood sacrifices unto evil spirits to advance the political and economic agenda of their homeland. It happens all the time. And the German tribes only have benefits if they would join the empire. For example. You have a kingdom in southern Greater Germany called Bohemia. This kingdom was formed by Germans who were spies for Rome. The king of Bohemia is following the policies of the Roman Principate. He is also taxing his own people and surrendering a part of the income to the Roman legions near the Daub frontier. The best way to rule a people is to let them believe that they are free. The best way is to fabricate an event that suggests that they are free. 
like an army of their enemy that was defeated in this way they can always point out to the historical event as evidence for their claim of autonomy. What the fools don't realize is that the facts are told mixed with a lie. Because of their ignorance and their unwillingness to give up their fantasy, they will never know that they've been set up. Now that we are talking about this, why would the Romans even want this to become public? Why would they broadcast their own defeat? It doesn't make any sense for a dominant civilization as theirs to do that. Don't he be deceived. The devil comes in many disguises and often he comes as everything you ever wanted. 11. Pie opens another scroll. It's a report. They read it together. It's written in both Scandinavian and Greek. We arrived in the country of the Carbons people on the 78th day after our departure from the Flevo Lake, in province Lower Germany. The journey from Cytoia, a small country in Scandia, to Carbwoa crossing the Sarmatia Ocean was two days and five hours. The landlord of a coastal village welcomed us in his harbour. We paid one denarius to the landlord as a tribute for passing through his area. From that village there was a native road constructed by civilians going to their capital, which was close to the Carbons Lake, which is also at the border of Save area. At the Carbwara capital we received audience with the local leaders. They have a legal king, who inherits the throne by heritage. He, however, doesn't make any political, military nor economic decisions. The decisions are made by the elders, who are elected every year by the mature women in the community. The queen consort leads the council of elders. We told the elders that we were Batavias, living at the end of the Rhine River. We were there to make a treaty for trade in Somarsha grain in exchange for German fish. After a cosalatio of five days the elders, under the approval of the Queen, approved a treaty. The treaty included that we were allowed to build a small settlement, at their coast, at the Alamoyam Sea, that's between the lands of the Finns and Kabwaya. At least 200 people must live at the settlement. Furthermore, the Carbwoyers would be permitted to also send 200 people to live on our shores. The payments of the transactions would take place in the Great Bay of Eregos. The Carbwoyers have an exclave at the international harbours where the goods will be trades before they continue to either Frisier or to Carbwoya. We agreed with the terms. After 11 days we crossed a river into the Kingdom Save area, which population is related to the Carbwoyers, their language is also similar. In the Kingdom of Save area we didn't succeed into getting an economic contract. We were told that they are willingly to trade with the Carbwoyers as mediator. The noble families of Saveria were afraid that this agreement could be used by the Roman government in Gaul to send spies to their lands. Other nobles agreed to trade in seasonal laborers. We made clear that we will discuss the matter with our employers at home when we return. At the Ruba River, we took a ferry to the shores of the Valtai people. The Valtai agreed to a trade in commerce. After 20 day in Somarsha, which was 98th day of our journey, we hired a captain to bring us to Sjavikam Island. The crossing of the Somatian Ocean and the Sjavikam Sea took four days due to a delay caused by opposite wind on day two. After a stop of two days at Sjavikam Island, we took another ferry going to Aglia, a country below Cimbria, at the north of the area of the Saxons tribe which lies at the Albis River. In Aglia we lodged for five days. Before continuing Abulia City. The sailing from the Albis River to Abulia, on the Abulia River, took three days and 19 hours.
In total our journey through Skadiavia and the coastal regions of Somarsha together took 115 days and 12 hours. We made 34 agreements with noble families, with regional kings and with several sailing corporations that operate on those seas. This document, signed by us, Prosquius Thamius and Arnus Damatus, serve as a documented report of the establishment of the 34 treaties between the Batavias in Lower Germany and their business partners in Aragos, Scandia, Cimbria, Saveria, Carboia, Veltia. This document is written by me, Titus, a tax collector that joined the journey undertaken by these government agents, merchants, soldiers in disguise and slaves. Well, we should be able to find more about this in the capital. 12. Check this last scroll pie opens it it's a list of commerce that was imported and exported last year they both read through the whole scroll. I didn't realize that every year a whole Spanish fleet with goods arrive over here. Neither did I, pie she goes through the document again hold on a minute. Evely reads about a yearly income of 2.000000 a cease from investments made in Retia and Peroya. Interesting. So what's happening to all that money? No idea. Government stuff I think. Peroya. I've heard of that country. A big Roman province. Next to Oricum. While the girls are reading, someone knocks on the door. Who can it be? Pie asks maybe one of the visitors. I don't think so. Turn off all the lights. Now. Pie obeys. When all the lights are out, someone knocks again. Everly check behind the curtain to see who it is. When she does. She sees that it's one of the men who is lodging downstairs. She opens the door. It's freezing cold. What do you want? I am one of the passengers that arrived here today. I've been told that you're the personal servant of the local queen here. Yeah. What can I do for you? I want to get employed. Maybe you can talk with your master for me so she can hire me. All right, I'll do it. You will have to wait some days, okay? What's your name? Essayers. I'll be here for a couple of days. Oak. Bye. She closes the door and walks towards the kitchen. It's dark but she can see. Pie turns the kitchen light on. That was a creep. It's good that you had cut him off. There's also a small very small room in the room where there's a bathtub with a sink. Pie. I will make a hot bathtub. You wanna join? Sure. Tomorrow I will be washing some clothes. Feel free to join me. Everly lets the water fill the tub. Then she lights the fireplace below to make the tub warm. While she's waiting, Pie takes another sip of wine. 13. The ship with Queen Anna and Queen Thea is sailing, together with the other ships, at the FJA with Tilda RDS. The captains remain close to the shore so they won't be blown away far away on the sea. The ship with the passengers are before and behind them. Queen Anna is lying on her side on the bed, with only her green top and green panties on. Her head is lying on the soft pillow. She is looking at Queen Thea. Thea is sitting with her legs crossed, at the desk, near the window. She is writing, wearing her silver crown, with blue and red jewels. A white transparent shirt, a short red skirt, white panties, blue knee socks, 
golden sandals and a white scarf around her neck. Her Egyptian pen is going on all the papers. What are you writing? Thea, she now sits with legs crossed to it's late and cold. Some letters to my village. I've expanded my influence by constructing a village with 340 small houses and two farmhouses. Where? Some 10 miles away from Jehuduam at a small lake, near the shore. When did you do this? I never heard anyone talking about it. It's because I didn't tell anyone. There are many poor and neglected people in the eastern parts of Eregos. So I decided why not construct a village for them. I hired two architects from the Eregos capital, together with 40 construction workers. The village was done last summer. And the building process took only a month. I call the village Juvavia just like the city Juvavia in the Auric Kingdom. Juvavia is a beautiful name, isn't it? How did you finance all of this? And who is? Ive used money from the treasury. There is much money being made in the trade. And there are also a lot of Frisians who trade with us. So, I took some of the cash and invested it. Nobody cares about it. And as the wife of the king, I have a right to his finances. I don't want to make my life dependent upon Ludo. That's not wise. What if he's killed tomorrow or if he is chased away? Then my whole life is falling apart. Number The village I constructed there are many poor peasants living there now and they are also having families as I've heard lately. You got your own village. Or should I say? Small city. Well there are about 880 people living there now. And with the current pregnancies. There will be 1200 people soon. 400 pregnancies. Well. Within 20 years. That settlement might have 7,000 people and they might be allies for the Luso Aragoas like us. Jehuduam and Bethelem together will have around 60.000 inhabitants 20 years from now. Aragos itself will be around 640.000 people. Together with the Luso Aragoas. Aragos will have 700.000 inhabitants. The increase of the population might also increase tensions. Aragos also has frictions between themselves. So it's good to get some allies now. So that in the future you will have people at your side. If you wait till the bombs are exploding, you are way too late. If a war may break out or some famine occurs, the Aragos population might drop till 300.000 of 200.000. But that will lead to also much disturbance for the Luso ethnicity in this land. You're quite busy with the future. Well, we won't always be here you know. Our children, grandchildren great-grandchildren and the rest of our posterity will have to deal with what we leave behind. So, why not at least attempt to leave them something worthwhile? You can't control the future. You can only influence it with what you do today. Don't fret about it. You rewrite about that. She lays down her pen and puts away the scrolls in the desk and looks outside. She lights some incense at the desk. The smoke of it fills the room. She walks towards the bed and gets beneath the purple blanket, after taking of her shirt, sandals and jewelry. Anna, please get me some beer her co-wife stands up, 
walks towards a cabinet and gets a small bottle of Erigo beer out of it. At the desk she pours half of it in a decorated cup. Here. Thea drinks it sip by sip. What is the first thing you will do when we're back? Thea asks while finishing the beer what have you missed? We were only away for a bit more than two weeks. Well. I'll look for Eveli that's for sure. She has been guarding my belongings. And afterwards I'll check out Ludo. You. I too go for Ludo directly. My cycle has begun again. So I'll be in my fertile phase again. I would like to get some semen to get another child. Well, me first. Ha ha. Don't worry. Ludo always has time for the ladies. Always. Maybe you get give your two new maid servants over to him. To give him more kids. Why aren't you giving him Everly? Number. Everly is dear to me. I don't consider her a slave at all. You re her lover. No. Absolutely not. I'm not into that crazy stuff. She is. Apparently. What? The girl is way too good believing. She isn't stupid. But she is quite Ave also. Sodomites can easily mislead her and do whatever they want with her. Do we have Sodomites in Luso Erigos? Sodomites are everywhere, among all kin and all tribes. Many of them however remain hidden. Who do you suspect of being a Sodomite? Well, some of the elders to begin with. M one of the sons of Ludo that he had with a Belgian concubine. And Paulia, his Belgian concubine and mother of his heir, Parisius. Paulia. She's a Sodomite. She is of both ways. She even seduced me a while back. Oosh well. I really missed something. She kept on harassing me. For about two months. So what happened? I gave in to get rid of her. You did what? Well, I'm not proud of it, okay. However, that woman is a crazy bitch. I also think she is demo-possessed. And you allowed her to have her way with you. Anna shakes her head don't he think that she is letting go of you now? Well, she came afterwards again. Eleven times. You should tell Ludo. She must stop forcing her perversion upon you. It's wrong. Hum. By the way. She has a daughter. Right. Yes, Pie. She is not a daughter of Ludo. Not. She got into an affair with a German soldier. The affair only endured for about two weeks. When the soldier heard she conceived. He took off. The border patrol at the harbor heard about what he did and they had put him in jail till the pregnancy was over. The soldier was had the choice to choose out of imprisonment till death or working to pay child support. He chose the latter. Also the matter would remain quiet and it would not be reported to his tribe in Germany. Pie was treated with Lovig Kaides by Ludo and her other half-siblings. I didn't knew that. Anyway. I think she's a sodomite too. Come on now. Anna. I'm telling you. The girl is just like her mother. Not the exact same way. But she has certain traits of that woman inside of her. She is also unable to form stable relationships with men. She always gets angry with men. Interesting. Ah well. Let's sleep now. 
we still need to go two full days before arriving. 14. While the two girls were bathing, a group of robbers approached the harbor. Their leader is Theotrix. His men are 78 in total, they are on horses. One of the robbers is sent out by the leader to spy on the harbor. His name is Adoyas and he was born in Cimbria. He parked his horse at the inn. He used a trick to break the locks of the door and entered. He found out that the whole inn was empty. He rushed to the border patrol room. Empty too. He did search through the four ships that were present. He only encountered a sack with 300 Roman silver coins. At last he decided to walk upstairs to the first floor. He enters through several rooms, but they are empty also. Then he hears the sound of people bathing. He rushes to the door, but opens it quietly. Inside the apartment is well furnished with expensive objects. He sneaks towards the kitchen and he hears two young women talking. The two girls aren't even aware of the intruder. Adoyas however is not interested in harming anyone, only in looting, so he leaves with the bag of silver coins. When he leaves, the girls get out of the bathtub and dry themselves with the towels. Adoyas left the front door open. Did you leave the front door open? Pie is pointing to the door it's open and cold. No. Evie Lai thinks it's quite strange. Stay here. She wraps herself around with a thick blanket, puts on sandals and picks up a large knife and walks towards the entrance. When she's outside she notices the footsteps in the snow. Pie follows her. Look. Someone broke in. Quite Pie she puts her finger on her lips hold on. Pie then points to a man in warm winter clothes walking besides his horse. With a large sack with him. Who is he? Pie and Evelyn dress quickly, put warm jackets on, and walk downstairs to follow him. They notice how the man walks a distance and then returns with a whole group on a horse. The women are now outside the harbour, behind a tree. They see how he is walking on the provincial road and encounters a group on a horses. He hands over the sack. There's nobody over there. It seems like everyone left. Strange. Theoric utters this is where the princess of the Gorti travelled to, together with the Roman visitors. Well, I guess we failed in our assignment to assassin them. Boss, we can lodge in the harbour here. There is still some food supply inside. Are you sure there was nobody there? That nobody followed you? I am certain boss. I checked all the rooms also. Well, all right. You take half of the men with you and lodge in the inn, while we lodge in the other spaces of the harbor. I see that there's a large barn also. Put the horses inside so they can remain alive. Tomorrow we'll feed them and continue to Jehuduum and the smaller villages of the Luso Aragoas. The two girls ran off to their small apartment, as quick as they could. What will we do now? We will be captured, raped. Sold into slavery. Oh dear. Hold on Pie. She tries to calm her down there is a tunnel that Ludo's father and his servants had dug from here to the other side of the area. The entrance is in the inn, I know the entrance. Just follow me. Both girls enter the inn right on time, because just when they close it the door, a group of riders come around the corner. Inside the inn, they heard them arriving. They grab two lamps, 
light them on and enter through the gate and close it behind them. We need to move on. Quickly. It's like 20 minutes walking. After 35 minutes of walking the youngsters arrived at the exit. They arrived at a small village, just outside Jehuduam. The village had only 110 inhabitants. Most people were sleeping at this time. The girls ran to the city gate. One of the guards recognized Evelai and he and the other guard allowed them to enter. They rushed towards the palace. They encounter one of Ludo's Belgian lovers. Both inform about the robbers in the harbor and that they need to speak to Ludo as soon as possible. Within ten minutes Ludo is woken by his guards and informed about the state of affairs. Knowingly that within two or three days the fleet will return from Bethlehem, he realizes that he needs to deal quickly. Everly. Stay here with Pie. You're safe inside the city walls. Ludo at the same hour gathers 400 men, 150 on horses and 250 on foot and he leaves towards the harbor. 15. When Ludovicus and his troops passed by his second palace he commanded them to wait. It was still another two miles to the harbor. Hide yourself, the king commands you you and you. Go there and enter the ships and sail away so they won't escape by water. The fifty men at foot do as commanded. When the ships were sailing away, some of the robbers realized that something was wrong. They however couldn't stop the ships anymore. Many fled to their horses to get away when they arrived outside the harbor on the provincial road they encountered fifty of Ludo's cavalry. A battle occurred. Thirty-four of Ludo's men were wounded, and five of theirs. And they escaped. They managed to capture seven of them and bring them to the prison in the city. The wounded men were treated by the doctors. The next morning everyone inside the city and in the villages was aware of what happened and great anxiety came upon them. Ludo commanded all the villages to be abandoned and everyone to take refuge inside the city walls. Furthermore, 1500 of the infantry were stationed, armed, divided around the city walls. Of the cavalry 500 were stationed spread around the villages. There was enough food supply for at least a month but Ludo recognized the danger that had occupied them. The king is discussing the matter with the elders. They came to the conclusion that they need help from the Aragoas to solve this matter. Because of the controversial relations with the Aragoas Ludo sent Evelai, Queen Anna's servant, together with Pie, the daughter of his Belgian concubine two of his sons and several elders and their wives towards the capital of Aragos. Furthermore, Ludo stationed 100 men at the harbor, armed, to guard the people that would return from Bethlehem. The messengers towards the Aragoa king left in the afternoon by a fast chariot. They arrived in the city by traveling an alternative road, which is often avoided because of the wild animals. They arrived within two days. 16. The boats with the refugees and the crew of both queens arrived at the harbor. The two consorts were informed immediately of what has occurred. Everyone was removed to the city and locked behind its walls. At the same time, in the Aragoa capital, the messengers request audience with the king. Pie takes the word because she is more fluent in the Scandinavian language. Three days ago our harbor was invaded by robbers who intended to loot and harm our civilians. We confronted them, but most of them escaped. We captured six and made them prisoners. Our people are now safe behind our walls, however, 
we need assistance in this thread. This is something that will impact the whole of Eregos. Because there were also Romans that lodged in the harbour. They arrived the same day. In the morning, that the robbers arrived in the night. The Romans were accompanied by a blonde princess Alva, from a kingdom in the country of the Scandians. We don't know where she, her female travel mate nor the Romans went. There are Scandians living in Jehuduum and they didn't expect any visit of their people either so we don't know what's going on. We do know we need to act. When the king and the Aragoa senate heard about the presence of Romans, they became frightened. The senate sent the Luso Aragoas away to discuss the matter. What shall we do? If there are Romans here and something happens to them. The Romans will use this as an excuse to invade our country and annex us. The whole defeat in Teutoburg in Greater Germany was just a strategy to give us false hope they are coming for us. We don't intend on being made slaves and paying enormous taxes. The king takes the word hold on, brethren. We can worry about possible outcomes when we are safe. I want have all troops ready at the shores. Also release prisoners to stand guard at the Great Bay. Furthermore, interrogate everyone who has been released from prisons in the past two months. And send 1500 men towards Jehuduum to assist King Ludovicus. At this moment I consider the Luso Aragoas as one of our own people. I don't care about the rivalries and post-incidents. Our safety as a nation is what matters now. The messengers are commanded to stay at the palace of the King of Aragos, while the 1500 men are sent to their leader. The reason why King Balder Old U2 was hospitable towards them was not out of generosity. He intended to use them as hostages to blackmail the Luso Aragoas to merge together with the Aragoas. Everyone in the Aragoa capital is also upset. The tensions are rising. The rumors about a possible war with Rome is devastating. Not only that, there are also many blood rivalries between the Aragoas. Anything could happen and there are also other local dynasties who have ambitions to reform and take over the Aragoa throne. Some of the local princely dynasties intend to become a Roman client state to be included in the empire, others are aiming at uniting Aragos together with Scandia to form one Scandinavian kingdom. So King Balder understood that massive bloodshed was just around the corner. 17. At the palace Evelie and Pie received a large apartment and there were servants providing them all kinds of luxury. Bilger was one of the cousin of the Aragoa king. His father is the uncle of the king and a senior member of the senate who also has multiple illegitimate children with Scandian women. Bilger was only 16 and he just finished his military training. He was exempt from going to Jehuduum on request of his father. On the second day, in the night, after the arrival of Pie and Evelie in the capital, Bilger visits the two youngsters. Bilder is a bit tall, blonde, bright blue eyes and he is wearing his armor. He came to inform about their people. When he left Pie shared with Evelie that she has an interest in the guy. But they were discouraged when they found out later that night, through a female servant, that he was already taken. Queen Anna is in her private room again. She misses Evely. But she is accompanied by Queen Thea. Both became close friends after their time in Bethlehem. Both Anna and Thea decide to compose a letter to the Hebrews in Cimbria. Shalom. We are the two wives of Ludoyahu, Olyuso Israelite brother, 
who is the king of the Luso Aragoa tribe living in the west of the kingdom Aragos. Our community is threatened with a military conflict. Because of this we require asylum among the Israelite community in Cimbria. We both speak the Hebrew language, and we are also familiar with the Danite dialect. We will pay for our residence among your villages and our servant will attend the synagogues, keep the Sabbaths, refrain ourselves from eating food that's not kosher, especially pork, and we won't form any threat to your establishment. Our asylum is only for the spring season. We hope that the tensions in our area will be over before the arrival of summer. Greetings. Anna and Thea, Princesses of Eleusitia, Princesses of Aragos. The three messengers are sent away. Just one hour afterwards the troops of Aragos arrive at the city wall with the message of aid for Eudovicus. With the presence of the extra infantry, Ludo permitted everyone to return to their homes. Both queens did not inform their husband of their request for temporary residence in Cimbria. The reason being is that the attention of their husband is now on the defense of his people. Furthermore, the women aren't sure if the city walls could prevent them from harm. Suddenly, Ludo himself came with the proposal for the women to go to Cimbria or Caledoia till the whole mess was over. We will go to Cimbria. Thanks Anna kisses him. We too leave tomorrow. The messengers were stopped at the harbour, because the guards didn't trust them. It worked out well because if they would have sailed to Cimbria, and short afterwards, the princesses themselves would arrive, they would be the ones that would appear suspicious. The messengers show the letter of the queens, but the soldiers only obeyed the commands of the king and their other superiors not of the king's women. The same day Queen Anna arrived and lodged in the harbour. The messengers were released. Five hours after they left both princesses, the governor of Beetlem was also warned of the circumstance. Queen Thea at the same time was laying on her sofa, drinking rice wine and her servants were packing her important belongings, especially clothes and jewellery. King Ludo entered to check if everything was going as planned. He then kissed his wife and she undressed him and herself. Thea lay on her back while spreading her legs and holding each leg in each hand beside her. Come, Ludo, I want your cream. Inside. After a while he comes inside her. The king leaves because of all the other things he has to do. What Thea didn't tell him is that she is at the height of her ovulatio. So within nine months Ludo will have another daughter of son. 18. Adoyas, one of the robbers, becomes aware of the fear that has come upon the Aragua people. He didn't expect that their expedition would have such an impact. What people also didn't knew was that Adoyas was the half-brother of King Ludo, which his father begot with an Aragua maid. Adoyas was never recognized by the family. Adoyas grew up in a poor rural area in the north of Aragos. He was frequently abused by his alcoholic stepfather and his birth mother was too cowardly to do anything on his behalf. He was also shunned by his environment because of his paternal ancestry. His mother died when he was twelve and since then he was a vagabond wandering around. When he was twenty-two he joined the military and served six years before he was sent home. He was renting a room in the capital, it's there that he met Therix. Therix is an ex-convict from the Greater Bay Area, who was expelled by his wife for endangering their family with his criminal activities. His children has broken all contact with him and he's not permitted to see his grandchildren. 
Theryx recruited Adoyas into his gang and they plundered and looted many rich people who became rich by exploiting the poor. Adoyas is now 38 years old and he considers leaving the gang. He, however, is way that you can only leave by death. He is back in the capital while the rest of the gang is raging in the south. After their failure at Jehuduim he fled to make Theryx and the other believe that he was captured. When he is carrying his groceries to his house he sees two known faces. Those are the two women he saw bathing together back at the harbour. They were lying on each other with their eyes closed, and talking, so they never noticed him breaking in. He is very surprised. Who are those women, he informs at a bartender. Those are two of the war prisoners of King Balder. They don't know it yet. They are servants at the palace of the Lusitias in Eregos. I see. Adoyas leaves to his apartment. The next day he approaches the apartment where the women are lodging. He sees that there are guards. He pays one of them ten a cease and he allows him to pass. When he knocks on the door, the blonde one opens. Good morning sir, what can I do for you? I am from the court of King Balder and I've been sent to check if the heating is working correctly. Ah well. Come in. Inside Evelai is cooking some food. Good morning they greet each other. While he is checking the heating, Pie puts a knife to his throat and grabs him behind the neck with the other hand. Now you tell me the truth. You aren't here to check any heating aren't you? You are that loser who broke into our apartment at the harbour. I recognise your voice you fool. So. What did you do? Follow us. Who are you? Speak or else you'll lose some blood. All right. I surrender. I'm Adoyas, but my Erigo's name is Ilof. My mother was a hotel maid in the capital and she got into a one-night stand with all you Zatia guy. That guy's name us Tule. I found out later that he was the leader of all you Zatia Erigo a tribe at the shore. I'm a half-brother of your King Ludovicus. I've joined a gang years ago. We are going around robbing villages and plundering the storehouses of rich people. We also kidnapped a lot of people in exchange for ransom. I wanted to loot Jehuduim as revenge for not being accepted by my paternal family. But. We didn't. You said to your boss that there was nobody there and that you checked all the rooms. Why didn't you betray us? Well the same might happen as what happened to my mother and I didn't want another child to go through the same mess as me. Look, I agree I'm not a good guy but I'm not a psychopath. Pie puts the knife away and turns him around. Then she forces her tongue into his mouth. Adoyas is very confounded and confused about what's happening. Don't he say a word about it. Come to my room. Pie locks him into the room and takes the keys with her. 19. Queen Anna and Queen Thea are on their ship. It's still an half hour before they arrive at the shores of the Cimbria area called Chalsoisus which is inhabited by the Chilsoisi tribe. While they are sailing in safety, in the Greater Bay Area a revolt is taking place. Theryx, and five other gang leaders, are plundering the harbours and chasing away merchants. When King Balder heard the news he sent 2,000 men to deal with the issue. It became one big massacre that killed 842 civilians. 331 soldiers and 22 of the criminals. In the capital, Evelai and Pie decided that they would let their prisoner go. 
they won't solve anything by keeping a prisoner. It would only cause more suspicion and increase wood to the burning fire. Hold on. Everly. Pie thinks about something you know. We should take advantage of this circumstance. In the Lusitia villages we are just servants. Favoured servants, but just servants. Here we have more security than in Jehuduum. We can start a new life. How do you want to do that we are only here because King Balder allows it? Besides, we have quite some luxury in Jehuduum. True. But we have quite some restrictions. I'm just saying. Why don't we take some advantage of the circumstance here? Look. The Lusitia Aragoa population is increasing and after this conflict the Aragoa conflicts will also increase. This guy here is an unwelcome prince of Ludo's kingdom. During this conflict his kingdom will need allies. Right. Yeah. Everly gets interested tell me more. If we bear his children. We have become his legal wives. And because of those children we can get him into the court. So soon when the population has grown in the north, in Bethlehem. Adoyas might become the leader there and we his consorts. You mean? A separate kingdom under Adoyas. Not a separate kingdom. Just being influential women in noble families. There's something into that. Evelai. You've been molested by my mother and your own parents are out of their mind. Your relatives don't care about you. The people there think you're a weirdo. You only have Queen Anna as your friend and you're quite close with her. Just remember. Queen Anna's first priority is her husband and she is burdened with her role as supported and sexual provider for her husband. When she has her first child. You're gone. What kind of future do you have over there? Everly thinks deeply. You rewrite. I mean for real. I don't have a future over there. I never wanted to think about it. It hurts when I think about it. Everly confesses you know. I'm fed up with those people. Not with Anna. But with the whole thing. Folks are still blaming me as if I'm responsible for what my mother did to my father. It's easier to blame a victim than to take responsibility. Well. I'm taking responsibility now. I'm not going back. Everly takes a bottle of wine and drinks it till it's half empty. So she gives the bottle to Pie. Who is going first? Me or you? 20. Pie is waiting till her cycle is over. Everly is sleeping with Adoyas for five days after each other. Each evening. After the fifth day Pie sleeps three days with him each evening. After a week both women realize that they are pregnant. The circumstances in Eragos are still very volatile. Adoyas is informed about their plan. He consented because he has nobody to turn to. When the women realized they were pregnant they informed King Balder. The king didn't want this to become public, because the people might begin to ask questions. The king requested them to return to Jehuduam but the women wanted to turn to Bethlehem. King Balder allowed them. Queen Anna and Queen Thea were keeping the Sabbath in Cimbria, when Thea revealed that she was pregnant. The same day she revealed that she was pregnant, King Ludo, came by to visit them. He was very happy with news and he held a celebration the next day to not violate the Sabbath to celebrate Thea's pregnancy.
In the evening of that celebration Anna became furious. She felt neglected because Thea was receiving so much attention. The next day she seduced her husband and lay with him. She slept with him for a week, every day, in the evening and in the morning, also on the Sabbath. The king remained in Cimbria for another week. And Anna was also pregnant. This would be her first child. Three days after her discovery of pregnancy Ludo held a celebration for her also and he requested the elders to give his wife gifts, to compensate for her years of infertility. While the celebration was going on, a messenger arrived at the shores of Chalsoesis. He delivered the message that there was a civil war in the east of Eregos and that the elders urged him to return. King Ludovicus left two days after the celebration, with his wives and their servants, back to Jehuduam. It was springtime by now and within a few days merchants from Vitica, Adelusia, would arrive with abundance of Spanish fruits, vegetables, fish and more. Also, some Hebrews' families would emigrate to his city. He didn't want to cancel his plans because of the turmoil in Eregos. When he arrived at the city he paid the troops lended to him by King Balder to construct a few more villages at the shores. And both of his wives, and his concubines and all his children were shipped to Bethlehem. In Bethlehem, Queen Anna and Queen Thea also found out of Pie and Everly's pregnancies. Two weeks afterwards, the Spanish merchants arrives, the Hebrews from Frisia also, and the community of the Luso Aragoas forgot about the troubles going on in Aragos. Many pregnancies began in Jehuduam at this time. 21. The civil war in Aragos lasted for two years costing around 29.000 lives throughout the country. It was at this time that Emperor Augustus died in the summer. Due to the death of Augustus the tensions in Aragos calmed down because the population turned their attention towards the politics in Rome. The new emperor Tiberius sent messengers to Scadiavia to establish better and peaceful political relations. Everly bore a son and she named him Olisipo, after the Lusitia capital Olisipo. Pie bore a twin, a daughter whom she named Tamila and a son whom she called Jock. Queen Anna bore a daughter whom she also named Anna, after herself. Queen Thea bore another daughter whom she named Alva. As years passed, Bethlehem grew into a town with 35.000 inhabitants. And the area of Jehuduam had 70.000 people. King Ludo died at age 65 and was buried beside his father. His son Parasius was crowned king two days after his death. Parasius took Anna, his father's widow, as his wife. And Anna bore him two more children, two daughters within two years. Princess Thea, who lost the position of queen, moved to Scandia with her daughters and wed them to local warriors. King Parasius surrendered half of his father's wealth to all his father's children, because he divided it equally among them. The other half he used to relieve the poor from poverty. The city Bethlehem became fully integrated under the administration of the leaders of Eregos, even though Parasius was still recognized as the legal leader. The reign of the Roman Emperor Caligula brought many disasters throughout the Roman Empire. It was during this time that some men from Spain arrived who were called Christians. They spoke of a message of hope for the salvation of mankind. Those men were slaves that helped the merchants. King Parasius resisted their message, but his two daughters, from a previous relationship, gladly received it. 
the gospel was preached throughout Aragos. Most of the converts were killed and beaten by angry pagan mobs. King Parasius himself died, after two years reigning, when he attempted to get all the Christians out of his territory. He was murdered by the elders who were envious of him. When Parasius died there was nobody who was willingly to take over the throne, and nobody did. Queen Anna's parents were still alive and she left Aragos to visit her relatives. She and her daughter with the same name, didn't want to be a part of the bloody rivalries that were going on. Anna and her three daughters migrated to save area where they took over her parents' farm. Within a half year Tamila, the 27-year-old daughter of Pae, was appointed queen by the capital of Aragos. This was done to prevent anarchy in the area, which was also quite important for commerce. Bethlehem was also given back to the Luso Aragoas. Tamila, however, didn't want to reign and allowed her mother Pae to make the decisions. So Pae was crowned instead of Tamila. Bethlehem she, Pae, gave away to Evelai, who became the legal ruler but it was her son Olisipo and his wife who actually ruled in the area. Pae and Evelai were both in their late forties now. They both still had a beautiful body and were attractive. Evelai had took a boyfriend of thirty to comfort her. Pae gave up upon men and began multiple affairs with many young women, all of whom she all treated as property. She would spend and spend money buying them expensive gifts and having disturbing parties to get into orgies with them. She also let people kidnap young girls to gratify her sadistic lusts. Her children abhorred her for this and she was avoided by most people. Nobody tried to turn her from her evil ways because she became a violent reprobate. She would wound and even kill anyone who had anything to say about her lifestyle. Evelai remained good friends with Pae, but she kept her distance to prevent her from molesting her, just like her mother Paulia did. That's how the kingdom of Ludovicus ended. Ludovicus reigned 44 years and died at age 65. His son reigned 2 years and died at age 52. Forty-six years it lasted.